we're going to use the standardized removal method, which is like this. It doesn't require much more than a gentle push to remove these panels. We've done a hell of a lot of custom wiring on the Sony PlayStation 5, and that's to do thermal testing. So we wired up thermocouples to various components in there, the back of the SOC, MOSFETs, things of that nature, to see once and for all how the thermal performance is of the PlayStation 5. There were some early thermographic images of PS5s and Xboxes externally, but those don't really tell you what's going on, what the heat is at the component level where it actually matters. Because the plastic doesn't much care if it's 40 degrees or 50 degrees Celsius. It's at the memory and the SOC and the capacitor level where that starts to matter. So that's what we're looking at today with a bunch of custom wiring and uh, testing the Sony PlayStation 5 in some gaming load scenarios. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So there's a lot we can do with this content. And what we've done for this one is take a look at thermals. We also have the noise performance, which we logged over a period of time. We logged the power consumption during the thermal tests so we can align the power consumption uh, with an interposer sitting between the wall and the PlayStation 5. So we put an interposer in there, we enable logging on it, and we're able to take the per second power consumption against the per second thermal numbers that we're getting from our uh, six thermocouples here. And so that allows us to plot the thermal change versus the power consumption spikes or declines, depending on what we're doing with the console or the game. All the testing was done in a standardized way, so we chose one specific spot in testing. For that testing sequence, we're using Astro's Playroom and specifically the cooling level, because that's what we're testing, so why not? We had the player positioned in the dust storm at the beach, and we chose this spot specifically because we wanted something with constant updates on the screen provided by the dust here, but also by the NPCs that are visible in the dust storm. So, that means that we have some assurance that the P states for the SOC, the, the GPU for example, would remain at their highest and fully engaged for the whole test period. The test period itself is one of the longest we've ever done. For CPU coolers, GPU coolers, typically about 23 minutes is the sweet spot where you're able to reach steady state, hold it for a couple minutes and get your numbers. But for this, we ran it for 60 minutes. And then we also did a cool down period. Where we measured the fall off to the menu where it's about 100 watts, then the fall off to an off state, to a power off position for the PlayStation 5. So all that testing allows us to get the full scope of how this thing heats up over time because in its stock state, we've taken off the panels clearly here, but in its stock state, it's got those panels on it that look kind of like a lab coat and could potentially act as an insulator. And that's why we wanted to give it so long. And it turns out that was the right move because it really only started to hit steady state in the last maybe 10 or so minutes of that one hour burn in. For thermal benchmarks of the PlayStation 5, we're gonna be showing the inside of this towards the end of the content and uh, examining why the performance is what it is. It hasn't been great for the memory, for example. So we're gonna look at the cooling solution and its shortcomings. One of them, a major one, is that the memory modules don't have contact to an actual real heat sink. They're just contacting the steel chassis. Now, a couple other things though, in order to do all this wiring, we really didn't wanna mess with removing the heat sink proper, as in the actual heat sink that's contacting the SOC, for a few reasons, we could redo the liquid metal if we had to, but really we want to leave that completely alone because liquid metal is very specifically applied, uh, whether it's by a machine or by a human, it takes a lot more care than thermal paste. We have a lot of experience with it, but we wanted to leave it alone for testing to keep everything as stock condition as possible. So, fortunately, the memory is on the back side of the motherboard PCB, so you actually don't need to take the cooler off in order to probe the memory with thermocouples. And then on the uh, SOC measurements, we just placed a thermocouple, a K-type thermocouple, into the back side of the socket of the SOC, so it's a BGA socket, placed it in the back side between some L MLCC caps and secured it there, and that gives us our backside of SOC temperatures. The VRM is also on the right side of the chassis where the memory is, so it's on the opposite side of the SOC, or at least most of the VRM is on the opposite side. And then for the thermocouple wiring on the memory, we wired the thermocouples right up against the memory casing, but in a way which didn't cause any height gradient 
or interference with the ability for the chassis to contact the memory. There is a small divot in the chassis that reaches down to the memory and contacts it via a very tiny thermal pad. Ultimately, these models do directly contact the world's tiniest thermal pad, trademark, on the chassis and have no direct heat sink contact, which is something we'll talk about more after the thermal test. The same is true for the NAND flash storage modules. And one thing we'd like to point out here too, there is an easily accessible expandable storage slot right here. So you take off the side panel. It's not as easy as some of the videos make it look, at least not for hours. We tapped it with a mallet really lightly and it came off and that reveals this. You pull that out, you can put an M.2 drive in there and it does not replace your original storage. So you don't need to do any reinstall or anything like that. You don't need some certified uh, special pre-installed OS on the stick as far as we're aware, because there is NAND on the motherboard. So it's actually BGA just straight to the board and uh, your OS should be able to remain intact while still expanding your storage. For the thermocouples, this is all pretty standard for us. We have a couple different kinds that we use. All of these are K-type. These are calibrated. I tested them in a boiling water bath and then an ice water bath before installing them into here. It's a little bit of extra time on our end, but not too difficult to do. And uh, that's the reason we do that is because thermocouples have a manufacturing variance for K-type of approximately plus or minus 2.2 degrees Celsius, but it is always the same offset sort of incorrect, we'll say, from a true whatever the temperature is. So if your true temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, you might get one thermocouple in a batch that's 102.2, and it's always 102.2. You might have one that's 99.5, and it's always 99.5. So they are precisely imprecise in that sense. Uh, but if you do a simple test beforehand by calibrating them, what you're really doing is understand, learning the offset that is required in order to get that thermocouple to equal all the other ones to equal whatever the temperature, the known temperature is. Next for the thermocouples, for some of them, like for the uh, memory, for example, for the top memory module, we used a 0.2 millimeter thick uh, polyamide film with a actually a fiberglass cloth in it to secure a ribbon type K thermocouple below the socket, below the BGA socket, and then one below the memory module. This adhesive does not interfere with the thermals. One, it's, it's one one hundredth of an inch thick. It's about 0.2 millimeters thick. And it's a polyamide, again, fiberglass cloth. It's designed for this. And also it's not covering anything that needs any kind of cooling or needs any kind of contact to a heat sink. In fact, it is basically sitting right on top of a bare PCB. And the measurement point is the only thing that really matters. And that's pushed up against the edge of something that's hot. So in this case, the edge of the SOC, the edge of the memory module, stuff like that. And then for the rest of them, we used our standard K types. Finally, for the VRM MOSFET thermocouple, we placed that one in the thermal putty. So I uh, saw some people online talking about, is that like a, a really thick thermal paste on the VRM? Sort of, it's, it's technically, it's a thermal putty is what it's called. We have some of the stuff here. This is a blue version of it, but it's the same type of thing. And uh, it's just a very, it's like a thermal pad that's moldable. So you'll see this in plumbing too, where it's typically used to fill gaps or something. It's a gap filler is what it's called in plumbing. But thermal putty is what you call it for when it's specifically designed for thermals. And that is molded over the VRM. And then that contacts the only access to a real heat sink other than the NAND on this side of the, the chassis, which is a small copper uh, plate that contacts to the rest of the heatsink on the other side. And we'll look at that after the thermal. So uh, that should be enough describing the testing environment. Let's get into the thermals and look at noise and power as well. And then we'll talk about how the design does. We'll start with the thermal testing of the PlayStation 5 and its stock configuration with both panels present and without any modifications. We also ran power consumption logging during this test, but we'll get to that chart later. Measured across about 67 minutes, we plotted ambient, VRM MOSFET, two memory modules, and two SOC locations. The MOSFET we measured plotted at about 71 degrees Celsius. Because we positioned this thermocouple slightly further away from the casing than we normally would on a PC component, the actual MOSFET temperature is running higher than this. MOSFETs and power components, though, can generally take upwards of 125 to even 150 degrees Celsius, depending on what the component is, like inductors, which are really just copper coils inside of a shell. They can take a lot more, but 71 is suboptimal considering how distant the measurement point is from the casing, but it's still within spec. Even in the 80s would be okay here, although indicative of poor design in that case. 
The bottom memory module that we measured is the worst of all of these parts. The thermocouple is butted right up against the side of the casing, so the actual memory silicon is anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees higher than the external casing temperature. Also remember that this is a flip chip PGA package, so that affects things too, it gets it closer to the PCB. The module measures about 94 degrees Celsius in an ambient of 21 degrees Celsius. In a hotter ambient environment, this could have memory running right up against its thermal limits with potential long-term downsides or even short-term uh, memory abnormalities and artifacting behavior. The second memory module measured much lower than this, but our point of measurement is also about a millimeter away from the casing for this one, so it's not direct contact. The SOC backside measured at about 68 to 70 degrees Celsius when tested in the center of the back of the socket with a thermocouple sandwiched between two of the uh, bulk filtering capacitors on the back, and this means that we're measuring through the PCB and then the substrate to hit the flip chip silicon. So we don't have any in silicon way to measure thermals like we do with PC components. We also didn't want to disturb the liquid metal, so this was the best way to take a measurement without actually removing the cooler from the SOC allowing the liquid metal to therefore remain undisturbed so that we didn't have to influence the measurement result. The bottom of the SOC measured warmer at 74 to 75 degrees Celsius, and overall the memory thermals were the most concerning out of these measurements. Before moving on, we'll draw two vertical lines on this chart. One at the 4,000 second mark, and then another one at the 6,000 second mark. At the 4,000 second mark, we exited the game and returned to the menu of the PS5. The console still ran at approximately 100 watts here, which we'll show soon, and so thermals fell to a steady state of about 65 degrees in the worst case, or about 45 to 50 for the rest. At the 6,000 second mark, we turned the console off, at which point the memory required about 10 minutes to fall 10 degrees Celsius while passively sitting there and uh, naturally cooling. This plot shows the temperature with the right panel removed. This exposes part of the intake for the blower fan, but it doesn't influence the exhaust air path, which is at the rear of the enclosure. Because this isn't an axial fan, removing the panel won't have as much impact as it would in a PC component, for example, at the inlet, because an axial fan, you're really restricting that airflow with a panel right up against it. But blower fans do a little bit better. The VRM MOS thermals remained around 70 degrees Celsius. The bottom memory module, our hottest measurement point, ran still at about 93 degrees Celsius. The top module measured about 64, with the SOC around 70 centrally, and 73 to 74 below it. At the 4200 second mark for this one, we turned the console off rather than exiting the game first, so we took it from 200 watts to zero pretty quickly, a couple seconds. It took 22 minutes just to fall to 40 degrees, which is still 20 degrees over ambient. Obviously, ambient is the starting temperature at the beginning of the test, and that's what we wanted to reach, but we eventually needed to move on and leave the office. So that's a long cooldown period just to get down to almost the starting point. With both panels removed, our VRM MOS temperature fell by 5 degrees Celsius, with the GDDR falling to 88 to 89 degrees from 93 previously. At this end of the scale, so close to TJ Maxx, that's a huge change. The panels are acting as a thermal insulator here, trapping heat against the body of the case that can otherwise be passively drafted away just by exposure to outside air. The second memory module is now in the 60s, down from 65 to 70 previously. As for the SOC thermals, those are in the range of 65 to 70 degrees Celsius. It helped to get a comparative bar chart at equilibrium instead of these line graphs. This chart represents the average data over a few hundred rows each, taken at steady state load at the end of the load test. The difference from removing one panel is minimal and mostly within the variance of the room temperature, but removing both panels had a meaningful and a measurable difference. Dropping 5 to 6 degrees off of the memory hotspot thermals is more significant at this end of the scale, and we see that same 5 degree benefit across the rest of the case. The design, we think, would benefit from some venting slats cut into the side of the panels, and this could probably even be done in a way that still maintains the PS5's attempt at a cool design aesthetic, and could be incorporated with the sort of futuristic motif that they're going for. That large fan doesn't generate enough pressure, ultimately, and that combined with poor heat sinking on the memory side of the PCB, which is opposite of the silicon, well, the SOC silicon side, is what's causing most of the PS5's issues. Ambient was within a range of about 1 degree Celsius for this test, so these numbers are about as on point as we can get it. Let's add one more line to that chart. 
This line contains the average hotspot data at steady state collected by a thermal camera with the stock configuration as measured when pointed at the side, the hottest side, of the PS5, which is typically the exhaust area. There are a number of flaws taking a thermal measurement of a closed box with a thermographic image and assuming it tells you anything useful. This is not really valid data. It doesn't tell us anything, but uh, we wanted to present it anyway. The chief of the issues is that this only tells you the temperature of the plastic, which isn't actually useful unless you're trying to determine if the plastic is outside of a spec and potentially going to incur some sort of damage. All of the heat is trapped inside of the box and it's not being exhausted properly, nor is it being conducted properly for some of these memory modules. So really you want to see the exhaust really hot because that means the air is getting out. And even then, since we're only imaging the plastic temperature, that's still of limited use. So then the thermographic image produces data that looks like this. Over a sufficient period of time, like several hours, the case will eventually get a bit hotter, but because the plastic is mostly isolated from contacting the housing where the heat is being generated, you're still going to be seeing this significant delta where it's just not useful data. It'd be like if you pointed a thermal camera at a sealed computer case and then tried to derive CPU temperature from it. Ignoring the fact that you've got reflectivity issues with glass side panels and maybe emissivity issues with other things, you'd still have no idea what the CPU's temperature is and the exterior being cool might just mean that it's good at trapping the heat inside. The prevalence of $100 thermal imagers for phones means a lot of people are trying to use them now. But our general advice to you is to not bother pointing a thermal camera at a closed computer case or a console and assume it provides any actionable information whatsoever. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna look at the cooling for this after doing all that testing. The point of this is going to be to sort of show or illustrate why the performance is what it is. And we just need to take it back apart to do that. It's not too hard to take apart, but it is kind of a pain. There's a lot of screws to track and they're varying sizes. Uh, so if you do take this apart, just be careful to notate where each one goes. So this socket's in on the optical drive side. This is the optical drive over here. This is the M.2 expandable drive. 12 volts, 2.4 amps, that's a lot of power. So this thing, if they ran it at 100% speed, could easily be pulling over you know, into, into the range of approaching mid 20s to 30 watts. So some of this really sucks to work on, uh, but that's just plastic housing. There's really nothing special here. This is made by Foxconn. And uh, we're just gonna go ahead and set this aside. At this point, we don't need it. Okay, there's the only heat sink on this side. The rest of it, you can see it's kind of over here. I found this interesting. So this doesn't actually contact anything, but you can see an imprint of like a CPU IHS or something right there. <laughs> so maybe for validation testing or something, not really sure what the cause of that would be because it does not contact any PlayStation 5 components ever. It's not like when I first tore it down, it's not like there was something there I didn't put back. It's just, it's always been like that. So just this marker that happens to look very similar in size to an IHS, maybe like a smaller Intel one or something. Um, but more realistically, it's probably part of, uh, it's probably something that gets burned in during validation testing. So this is basically what amounts to the heat sink and air quotes there for the, the memory and some of the other reverse side components. And it's magnetic. Uh, if there were, if you had any doubt that that might be aluminum, it is not aluminum. That is going to be just a steel. Here's where I routed all of my thermocouples. So I pushed them out this side because it was the only place where uh, there was a bit of an, an uplift in the plate so that we could run the cable through without affecting the performance. I really don't want to go through this again, but we're going to do it just to show you all what the cooler, what the cooler actually looks like. Uh, this is a huge pain. So before anyone gets any ideas, I do want to throw in a, a, a warning here too. Uh, for anyone who thinks that it might be cool to take off the plastic part of the chassis and point a thermal camera at this. Don't do that. You're gonna get the reflected temperature of your room more than anything else. You would need to, to coat it with something to turn it into a, a black body object to measure rather than a shiny reflective object. Okay, so here's the solution. 
so this piece of tape is not covering anything. I want to make that extremely clear. So that is not hindering any kind of performance. That's just holding these wires down while we talk about all of this. Um, so for the stuff that is uh, taking measurements, we, as I said earlier, we've got this wire running in here into the thermal putty, which is what this is. That's not a thermal pad or paste, it's a putty. So that's running in here. It terminates around this third inductor and MOSFET, and it's taking the measurement in between the two. So that would run hotter if we pushed it right up against either the MOSFET or the inductor there, alpha omega MOSFETs. And then uh, this green white wire, that's going to the hotspot module. And then uh, there's a little bit of thermal grease on here, but, and then this one is going up to the below the BGA socket measurement. And then the yellow one is going into the back of the BGA socket measurement. And then this thing is the retention plate for the heat sink on the other side. And uh, this thing right here, right there, not sure what metal that is. But that's a piece of metal that's sitting right on the back of the MLCCs in the back of the BGA. Okay, so for the stuff that actually matters then, the real problem with this, the real reason the memory is running so hot is because there is no actual heat sink on this side of the board. It's possible and maybe even likely that Sony was able to get, or AMD, but probably Sony, able to get a letter of exception from its memory supplier so that it doesn't need to, to strictly follow the spec, which if that's the case, they would have done endurance testing on it and decided that it's fine, but either way, it's suboptimal. And that's because this thing mounts like that. And if we pull it off like this, you'll see that this is not contacting the NAND. The NAND is, in fact, down here. So that is the storage without expanding to an M.2 device. This is actually over here on the side where there's really no heat being produced on this side of the PCB. And it looks like what they're doing is leveraging an area that's fairly free of components so that they can get a heat pipe run. And that's going to be, it looks like an 8 millimeter heat pipe. And this is routing into a copper plate, which is riveted in. And that's contacting this small fin stack. So that is the entirety of your VRM cooling capability on this side of the, the VRM. And the reason you can, you can see that is uh, there's a copper plate here. I mentioned this earlier in the script, but it's got little cutouts and they're soldered or weld, welded together to contact the, uh, the MOSFETs and the capacitors right here are contacting these circles in there. And then the inductors are contacting to some extent against these, but there's not a lot of coverage on the inductors. Not that they particularly need it, but they do run hot. As for the memory, the problem, if, other than not having a real heat sink connecting to it and just this steel plate, the other problem is there's not a lot of coverage. So we've done testing in the past. We're having full coverage over the whole module and even a little bit over the sides if they can do it mechanically is in fact superior to doing a small dot in the middle. Now the die itself is right in the middle of that and it's not like the actual piece of silicon, it's not taking up this whole thing. The actual piece of silicon is right there in the middle. It's not large, it's flip pit chip BGA, which means it's against the PCB. It's actually further from the top of the casing than it is from the PCB. And uh, even with all that in consideration, even in consideration that it's only a couple watts for these things, this is still significantly worse than full coverage with a thermal pad in our past testing, uh, at least for GPUs, and that should scale. Uh, that's testing we did with G5 on GPUs. So here's how the fan sits in here, and it'd be a little bit more recessed than that, but fan sits through here, and all the air is gonna come out and hit these fins. So this is cooling the SOC side, and this is unfortunately the part that we're not going to remove because there's some long-term validation reasons we wanna leave the liquid metal completely unmodified, and right now this thing has all of its tension against it still, uh, we did remove one of that steel plate I showed you on the other side we removed to get the thermal couple into the back of the B BGA socket, but it's fine. Uh, we didn't have to remove the screws. These fins are oriented this way, so they can get air from the blower fan. There's going to be some air channeled down this way. Heat pipes, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six uh, centrally on the SOC, which is right there. So that's the SOC Yep, uh, on the other side of this. And there's a big copper block down there, it looks like. I think that's copper, yeah. Uh, 
and then just the fin stack on top of it with one, two, three, five heat pipes end up terminating through on this side, and then one of them carries forward down here. And they do change size as they uh, taper towards the SOC, but it looks like they are, depending on where you measure it, going to be anywhere from a six to an eight mil. They get eight mil at the wider end. So the NAND doesn't really have any cooling, which is actually good. NAND likes to run hot. It's better for it when it's in use anyway. The memory, uh, this would explain it, okay. So our hotspot memory module, the hottest one we measured is actually right here. So it is not anywhere close even to this. Uh, it, it would ideally be at least making contact on the reverse side, on the, you know, the flip chip PCB side to something but instead it's just another steel plate. So that is why that one's running so hot then. That's, that's explained now. The cooler of them, the cooler of the two we measured is actually up in this area, uh, roughly. So that would explain why that one did so much better then. We took logging power measurements every second of the test during these processes. Testing at such a wide interval as one second does reduce the ability to see intermittent spikes, which are important for power measurements. But we'd only really be able to get those with an oscilloscope hookup, and we do have one, it's just that this allows us to see the overall average power consumption. We'll bring back the stock panel test chart that we showed earlier, but we'll remove a few items from it to simplify the legibility. The power consumption, shown against the right axis, climbs to about 200 watts immediately upon launching the game. Over the next 33 minutes, marked at 2,000 seconds, the power climbs to about 208 to 210 watts from an original power of about 200. This extra 10 watts is from two things. One is from the fan ramp. It's increasing the RPM a little bit, not much over the period of it, but at the outset, and that increases the power consumption. The other one is from power leakage from heat buildup in the parts, which is normal. With CPUs, a lot of the time, you'll see something like a 4% change in the power consumption as a result of leakage for every 10 or so degrees Celsius. You can see that during the menu, we were still drawing in the range of 100 watts. That's just on the PS5 menu system. So that's high for not really doing anything except for rendering a needlessly fancy menu. Noise measurements are up next. For this test, we used our standard acoustic testing methodology that's deployed for cooler and GPU reviews. We take measurements at a 20 inch distance from the device, as we always do, and test in a room with a noise floor of just 26 dB. That'd be similar to a quiet suburban household without any street noise and with the AC off, just for reference. This logging interval started at the peak point of load and logged while the console exited to the menu. The objective was to look at how the fan behavior changes, and therefore the noise, based on the load level. So, in this instance, we're going from 200 watts to 100 watts over a period of about 400 seconds. You can see the console, measured 20 inches away, ran between 33 dBA and 35 dBA when under 200 watts load. After the game was exited, the console spent about two minutes spinning down, and that was to sustain about a 31 to 32 dBA in a 100 watt load. If you're new here, please remember that noise isn't just a score. The distance and the noise floor both matter. So this can't be compared to other measurements from other publications. The end result is that the PS5 plots at a lower noise level than even the more aggressively silent GPUs, and that's measured at a distance that we use for testing computer parts. With a console, you're typically seated even further away. So it's unlikely that it would be too much of a concern for most people. Now, as for the annoying parts of noise, normally high frequency, we didn't notice any coil whine while playing. But that's going to vary so much from unit to unit that it's possible we just got lucky. So that's it for the PS5 thermals, noise, and power. Recap for you. Obviously, you should watch the actual content and testing if you want to understand any of it. But uh, the quick recap is, in terms of noise levels, it does seem fine. We saw a couple complaints online about coil wine, and we were not hearing any of that on our unit. Coil wine is something that will vary from unit to unit, so that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means we didn't hear it. And different scenarios will trigger coil wine too. So for example, with the GPU, if you're running a game at like 1,000 FPS, like in a menu or pointed at a black screen or something, it's a very good chance that on a card that will have coil wine, you'll hear it, whereas when you're running it, uh, typically under a different type of load, you might not. So different things will trigger it. We didn't hear coil wine with this particular unit, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The next thing on noise is at 20 inch distance, which is standard for our PC component testing. It was in the 33 to maybe max 35 range when under full load, which is actually pretty damn good. So it seems like Sony has listened to 
the complaints about the noise from previous generation consoles and tried to resolve it by running a massive fan as quietly as they could, which resulted in the higher thermals in some scenarios. Uh, there is room to scale this fan up a lot more. It could be way louder if they wanted it to be uh, because the amount of power it can pull approaching 30 watts is not insignificant for a fan. So it could definitely be louder, but at the noise level it's running right now, objectively, it's pretty quiet. It's in the range of, once you're actually sitting couch distance from it, say even three, four, five feet, but even at three feet, it's already going to fall below where we're measuring it, more towards the upper 20s or lower 30s. So noise, it seems like they've done a pretty good job there comparatively. Removing the panels helped with the thermals, but removing one of them wasn't good enough. Removing both was beneficial to the tune of about five degrees, and that's after accounting for ambient. So four or five degrees in there for memory thermals, for VRM, for SOC thermals. That was about the, the global impact on the PCB, a reduction of, let's call it 5C, from removing both panels. That's not a reasonable solution, obviously, but uh, there is room for Sony, if it wanted to, to maybe put some slats into the sides of the case in a way that still fits the design aesthetic. They've got that futuristic look. They could still hold that and get some extra cooling potential in there, specifically near the fan intake and anywhere else it's sort of trapping the, the heat to the, against the body of the chassis. Power consumption's pretty impressive. So this is true of consoles mostly every generation, but when you're looking at a 200 watt max power for the type of performance and graphics it's getting, that is well optimized, and that falls largely on AMD for doing the design work for the SOC for that, or for the CPU and the GPU for that. So AMD, uh, not surprisingly, has done a lot to improve the power envelope in this generation of console because it's already done that for its desktop and its server class hardware or with Zen architecture, RDNA architecture, all the previous architectures working up to it. They've been trying hard to work on power efficiency and with the newer Zen architectures and RDNA, uh, AMD has finally achieved some of those goals. So that's what you're seeing here. We're at 200 watts. The relative output in terms of graphics capabilities and frame rate performance overall is significantly higher than past devices. And uh, that's because of the silicon, the improvement at the silicon level and by the design teams at AMD. Thermally, thermally, it is definitely running a bit warmer than we'd like to see on the memory. So the hottest memory module we measured was about 90, 93, when in a room ambient between 21.9 or so and 23 point something. So very high for, for where it was measured. Couple things about that, that is the casing measurement of the memory module. It is possible that the silicon itself is cooler. Typically it would be warmer than that though. Uh, standard difference we see in like a GPU is about five to 10 degrees. And we know that with a GPU because with some GPUs in the past, you're given access to the on-die sensor of the memory. So you can check the on-die versus an external. And the delta we see is about five to 10 C depending on the type of memory it is. So uh, that said, it is not the best way to measure memory. And we acknowledge that. It's a pretty damn good one because you're taking a thermocouple right up against the size, side of it. But ideally we would have access to the internal die sensor to really get a confident, highly confident reading on the silicon temperature itself. Regardless of that though, at 93 degrees, uh, it's, it's safe to say we are uncomfortable with the temperature that the memory is running and that Sony definitely is heavily lacking in its design here. So all of the caveats aside, all the sort of testing methodology disclosures aside about the limitations of our, uh, our sensitivity to the temperature, ultimately it is running hot for at least that memory module and we would assume some of the other memory modules on the side furthest away from the heatsink. So Sony can improve here significantly, and the easiest ways it can do that in our past testing, and presumably Sony's done a lot of testing itself and should know more than us, but for one reason or another, it didn't do things that would definitely improve performance here. Uh, increasing the contact patch on the memory to this plate, this, this stupid low thermal conductivity plate, increasing the contact patch would definitely help improve memory thermals, because even though the silicon's in the middle of that casing, the heat's spreading through the whole thing, and pulling it away as fast as possible is always going to be beneficial, even if the silicon isn't necessary. It's like, think of an IHS. 
If you think of a CPU IHS and you only get coverage right in the, let's say, a monolithic die, right in the middle of the IHS, your performance will objectively be worse than if you get full spread over the IHS and you can leverage your whole cold plate on the CPU cooler. It will always be better if you do the latter versus if you get just a dot as large as the silicon and then put the cooler on top of it. So this is an easy area of improvement for Sony, full coverage on the memory modules, full thermal pad. And uh, I would assume this is not a being cheap thing. This seems like a design decision maybe to permit the clearance of this, but at least some of these modules toward the outer edges, they could have fit a much wider contact patch. Uh, really, we think that there should be better heat sink contact to the memory specifically for this, this console. The SOC, we can't get an on-die measurement, which is unfortunate, so we don't really know how hot that's running. It's in the 70s, though, in our test environment on the backside of the, uh, the SOC between the MLCCs, and that's typically a pretty good indication to the actual temperature, but it's not incinerating. We need more test resolution, though, to really call the SOC temperature. Memory temperature, though, I'm pretty confident in saying it's too hot and Sony should do something to try and keep that better in check, even if they've got a letter of exception from the memory manufacturer. It's just, uh, it's still poor design, ultimately. So this could be done better for the memory cooling. But that should give you a very good look at thermals, a uh, decent look at noise. We could, do, we could do more, but noise is pretty good shape. Power is good shape overall, and uh, thermals are, are running on the high side. So they could always push an update and spin that fan faster. There's plenty of room to do that, but then they get into noise complaints. That's it for this one. If they do a Gen 2, we think Sony should probably improve the contacts specifically to the memory modules and get a better heat sink in there. I'll check back for more. We'll try and work on the Xbox next, assuming we can uh, get one in within the timelines of also working on the RDNA 2 stuff. And check back for that. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly, like by buying one of our anti-static mod mats that we worked on for this. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.